April 21st, 1988, at the Church of Christ in Addison County, Vermont. This is the second lesson in a series of lessons centered around the general theme of Roman Catholic doctrine as seen by the Word of God. The particular lesson on this tape is the development of the papacy and hierarchy. The speaker is Dale Smelser of Fairlawn, New Jersey. Jay said it's nice to see all these faces <coughs> and all these bodies too. <laughs> we welcome those of you who are visiting with us and it's good to see brethren from other places. The task that we are involved in I'm sure is not easily understood by the casual observer. Why would a group of people get together and be critical of the religion of some other people? Well, you know, Jesus Christ was quite critical of the religion of the scribes and Pharisees in his day. He said, this is my Father's will and this is what you're doing. And this is wrong. And Amos was exceedingly critical of the religion of Israel of his day. He said, this is what our God has said do and this is what you're doing and this is wrong. In both instances and in instances like that throughout the Bible, the people of God call those who were disobeying God to repentance. We do not want to appear self-righteous or that we are smarter than anyone else. I don't believe that. I think there are some very smart people who would disagree with what I'm going to say this evening. There are some very smart people who will agree with it. So being smart is not the issue. The issue is, has God spoken? Has God revealed his will? And what is it? And we have not come together here to be unkind. We have not come together to hurt anybody's feelings or to make anybody uncomfortable. We have come together for a serious study of the word of God and how he wants us to serve him. And there is a powerful religious organization in the world this evening that believes that it is the true church, such as depicted on the title of this track, This Way to the True Church. And this track claims that the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church. And the priest writing the tract is talking to a lady who has some problems with Anglicanism or the Episcopal Church in this nation. And here's what he says to her. Do as I did and step from the unseaworthy ship of Anglicanism onto the solid wharf of Catholicism. Now this priest had no hesitancy to say the Anglican church is wrong. It is an unseaworthy ship and you need to leave it. And he has an assessment of Protestantism. And I'm sure he's a very smart man. And he says, Protestantism is a great evil. And I'm a very smart man, and I take exception to that. <laughs> but again, the point is, smartness, intelligence, is not the issue. We have a sincere disagreement. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that it is the one true church. We believe that that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. I believe there is 
a true church. I believe I can read about it in the Bible. But why does the Roman Catholic Church believe that it is the one true church? And in the past, it viewed all of us as hopelessly lost. There is some equivocation now, honestly, on that among a lot of Catholics and even really some language that's a little bit puzzling about that out of Vatican II, which met in the 60s, started under Pope John, ended under Pope Paul. And they look upon us now as separated brethren. And so in some sense, maybe we're brethren, but we are separated from the true church and the grace of God is really only available in that true church. And apart from its sacraments, and apart from its absolution from sin, I guess the bottom line is that we are still lost. Now, it doesn't hurt my feelings that Roman Catholics feel that way. I'm sure they're very sincere in that. They believe that religiously. That's what they've been taught, and that's what they believe the will of God is. And I am just not angry with a man or woman who speaks his or her mind about what they think the will of God is. And I hope he or she will allow me to speak my mind as to what I believe the will of God is, and then let us examine it and see. But why does the Roman Catholic Church claim to be the one true church? And that's summed up, really, in the word apostolicity. And you think about that for a moment and you'll see the meaning of it. They mean that they are apostolic. That they have their origination in the apostles. Now the essence of that claim is there were the apostles appointed by Jesus Christ and he left them on the earth to begin his church. And what they began was the Roman Catholic Church. And they are the Roman Catholic Church so they are apostolic. And they can trace their history all the way back from the present pope, back through all the popes of the centuries, to, as they would say, the first pope, Peter. They believe Peter was the first pope. They believe the church was built upon Peter. And they believe that the Lord building the church upon Peter gave him a primacy, not just an importance, but gave him a superiority over all of the rest of the apostles. And they believed that Peter was the first bishop of Rome. And they believe his succeeding bishops of, at Rome inherit his primacy. They believe the bishop of Rome inherits his superiority over everyone else. And that's evident when you look at the terms that describe the bishop of Rome. There is the term head of the church, pope, or papa, or pontiff, or his holiness. And in just a moment, I want us to take a look at those phrases in the light of the scriptures as they are applied to a man. And they believe that this primacy or superiority given to Peter and taken over by his successors, the bishops of Rome, who are the popes or the papas of the church involves that bishop or the pope in infallibility. He is infallible, and what he speaks is the truth of God and cannot be denied. And the pope wears a triple crown because he is supreme in heaven, he is supreme on the earth, and he is supreme in the underworld, that is. Through his absolutions, souls on this earth find their way to heaven. He is supreme in heaven, the Pope is. And on this earth, he has political and spiritual power. And also through his jurisdiction, souls are released from the pains of purgatory and issued forth into heaven and into eternal life. So he is then king of heaven, earth, and the underworld. So the Catholic Church is the one true church because its popes are the successors of Peter 
to whom was given a primacy, a supremacy, and infallibility. Well, how can you argue with that? I remember Peter, and I study about his greatness. And if he was Bishop of Rome, and if all of that accrued to him as Bishop of Rome, and if all of his successors had that power, then Catholicism has a powerful case for being the one true church. We'll look at that in a moment, but I said I wanted to look at these terms that are ascribed to Peter and his successors, supposed successors. First of all, head of the church. Now I can read in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 22 and 23, what God has done in respect of Jesus Christ, and it says that he has put all things in subjection under his feet and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said that Jesus Christ is the head over the church in all things. And I can turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and verses 4 and 5, and read, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called on one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God. There is one body, and the church is the body. We saw over there in Ephesians, the first chapter, and Jesus Christ is its head. And yet here is somebody on the earth being called the head of the church. What you would have there is a spiritual monstrosity because you've got one body, and the Bible is explicit, and it's got two heads. And uh, in the way they would line it up, one is on top of another. You've got the head Jesus Christ, you've got the head the Pope, and you've got one body. Looks like something is a bit awry there. But mark it down, unless I can find somebody else called the head of the church, I'm going to have to leave it right where the Bible leaves it, where it says Jesus Christ is the head of the church in all things. And about that term Pope, it is from the Latin Papa, which means Father. Now I want you to turn to the teachings of Jesus in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Pope means Father. In Matthew 23, Jesus is in controversy with some religious people, and that's what we mentioned just a moment ago. And uh, the thing he is condemning in this particular portion of the text is their outward manifestations of righteousness their dress, the dress of these religious leaders is different from the dresses of everybody else. The children of Israel wore a blue garment, a blue border on their garments. But these people, to affect holiness, wore wider blue border than everybody else did. They enlarged the borders of their garments. And they enlarged their phylacteries. Phylacteries were pouches upon which they kept scriptures in their clothing. Scriptures that they knew and had studied. And the bigger the fellow's phylacteries were, the more holy he was, you see. He had studied more scriptures. And so walk down the street and somebody says, Oh, there is a holy man. How do you know he's holy? Well, look at the way he's dressed. Look at the wide blue garment or the wide blue border, and look at the phylacteries and how full they are. I know he's holy by the way he's dressed. Well, now, you know, sometimes today you can tell people aren't holy by the way they're dressed in the immodest attire that a lot of people wear today. But Jesus condemned this sort of thing. He wanted to see holiness in their lives and not by a distinctive garb. And more than that, they, re they wore religious titles. And I want you to see what Jesus said about that in verse 9. In fact, we can start it in verse 7. They loved certain things, and the salutations in the marketplaces, and to be called of men, rabbi, teacher. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and all ye are brethren. Do you begin to get a picture of the disciples of Jesus Christ, of the church of Christ, the followers of Christ? They're all brethren. There isn't anybody who authoritarian, with an authoritarian position set over them. 
They love the chief seats, the greetings in the marketplaces, to be called rabbi. Now verse 9, and call no man your father on the earth. For one is your father, even he who is in heaven. I remember one time when I was in high school and a Catholic priest came to lecture our class about Catholicism. And this had puzzled me. And so when he asked for questions, I raised my hand and he called on me and I said, why, in the light of Jesus' teachings about calling no one on earth your father, have you been addressed here this morning and call yourself father? And he said, well, what do you call your earthly parent and I said father and he said well that's the reason and he went on now that doesn't explain it because the Bible indeed calls my earthly male parent and your earthly male parent father but in this context you see that Jesus is clearly speaking to people about religious practices and in the realm of religious practice he says I don't want to see this distinctive garb and he said, I don't want you wearing religious titles. And specifically, he said, don't call anybody on this earth your father. Spiritually, you have one father. And for people then, in a spiritual way, to address somebody as father is clearly to ignore what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has said. And to call one man on this earth, Pope or Papa or Father, Holy Father, is clearly to just say my tradition means more to me than what Jesus Christ has said. Do you want to know what Jesus says about that? In Matthew the 15th chapter in verse 19 he said, but in vain do you worship me <coughs> teaching as doctrine the commandments or traditions of men. My tradition cannot mean more to me than what Jesus Christ has said. If I find any practice of mine in conflict with what Jesus Christ has said, I must set it aside. In Hebrews, the first chapter and verse 1, it says that God in these days has spoken unto us through his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And if Jesus Christ says in a spiritual, religious sense, I don't want anybody called Father, you have one Father who is in heaven, I dare not do it. I do not care how many centuries may have established that practice. Head of the church, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Papa, we have one Father who is in heaven. Pontiff, do you know where that term came from? The same place that many practices that are very precious to many Roman Catholics came from. And when we get into a study of saints and relics and praying to Mary, you're going to see where so much of that came from. I'm going to tell you now, at the risk of losing you before you get back to hear that lesson, but it came out of paganism and the heathenism of the Roman Empire and subsequent times. And the title Pontiff came from that. The Roman emperor was called Pontifex Maximus, the maximum, the supreme pontiff. And pontiff means bridge. The Roman emperor was considered the supreme priest of Roman heathenism. He was the bridge between this world and the other world, and he was the supreme bridge. He was the supreme pontifex. He was the supreme pontiff. And that's exactly where the Roman Pope gets his title, pontiff. But is it applicable to him? Is he the bridge between man and the other world? Can we say that the Pope, in the authority given to him, is the bridge between man and God? Well, Roman Catholics do view him that way. But there's a passage in the Bible that speaks to that subject in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and verse 5. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 5. And the text says, 
There is one mediator between man and God, himself man, Christ Jesus. There is one mediator between man and God. And I'll tell you, if you are a Christian, and I hope we have time tonight and get to the passage that are passages that teaches that every Christian is a priest. Every Christian is a priest. And you don't have anybody between you on earth and heaven. You go directly to heaven because you are a priest. And Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the bridge and the only bridge we need between us and our Father. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And as far as bring the bridge, Jesus said in John 14 and verse 16, and you can quote it, I am the way. I am the way. You don't need another bridge. I am the way. I am the only mediator. I am the only one in between. There's a problem with calling any man on the earth the head of the church. There's a problem with calling any man on the earth the father. There is a problem with calling any man on the earth pontiff. And there is certainly a problem with calling any man on the earth his holiness. In Romans the 15th chapter and verse 4, it says that God alone is holy. Now I must say that there are different words translated holy. And there is a word that means set apart, consecrated, sanctified, and that is translated by our English term holy. And all of God's people are that. And it would not be right to take one of God's people and refer to him as his holiness and the rest as just something else. All of God's people are that. But in the sense of the term his holiness, Romans 15 and verse 4 says that only God, God alone, is holy. Isn't it really disturbing, and is somebody shaking their head, have I given the wrong passage there, Rome, Revelation, did I say Romans? How about Revelation 15 verse 4? If that's not right. Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. Okay, I appreciate that, so I can straighten it out. It's Revelation 15, but started with an R. <laughs> that's <laughs> not close enough, is it? But he alone is holy. I dare not. If I have regard for God and his word given by the Holy Spirit, I dare not refer to any man as his holiness. I think of the vision that Isaiah was granted of God. It was a vision in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. And God is going to bring judgment upon the nation of Israel, even though it contained the temple, the house of God. And God shows his displeasure with the people who are assembled there in this vision. First of all, Isaiah see, sees the throne lifted high in heaven and God upon it and the seraphim around him hovering in midair. And the train of his garment comes down and fills the temple. And the idea, I believe, is that you can't confine God to this temple or his house. Just the hem of his garment fills that. You haven't combined and enclosed all there is to God in this house and this temple and furthermore there was smoke that filled the temple and the foundations of it shook signifying God's displeasure with that people and his judgment that was going to come and in this picture of his righteousness and his holiness and his judgment that he was going to bring the seraphim cried out and said holy 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 is Jehovah his name is great in all the earth I believe that any serious student of the Word of God who has a love for God and regard for His holiness is not going to take the title of that magnificent scene and the title ascribed to God there, holy, in that sense, and apply it to any human being and call Him His holiness. No wonder when we look at what the Bible says says with regard to the significance of these terms head of the church pope pontiff his holiness that the bishop of Mainz of France in this period of the dark ages and when men are coming out of it in this period when the bible was taken even from the priests and they could have it only in latin and if they didn't know latin they didn't know what the bible said 
And somebody handed this archbishop one day a copy of the scriptures for him to look at and looking at it and not realizing what it was, said, I don't know what this book is, but I perceive that in everything it is against us. Isn't it remarkable that an archbishop had never read the Bible and did not know what the Bible said? And yet all through these centuries, when men do not know what the Bible says, practices are evolving. We should not be surprised that all sorts of unscriptural practices that God is not pleased with came into being. But besides the titles that are given to the popes claiming that they are the successors of Peter, let's ask this question, was the church built upon Peter? And turn with me to Matthew the 16th chapter. This is the passage that our Roman Catholic friends use and their scholars use to establish the primacy of Peter. This is the principle one. Jesus is with the twelve, and he asked them, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they answered that some say Jeremiah or John the Baptist or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, But whom do you say? Matthew 16, verse 16 is where the passage starts. And then he says, Who do men say the Son of Man is, and who do you say that I am? And let's get Peter's confession in verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And the assertion is, that the Lord said, I say to you, you are Peter, and Peter means rock. You are rock, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. But there's a problem there. There are two different words used there for rock. One indeed having to do with Peter. And Peter's name was Petros. And the other word is Petra. This is a feminine word, but it is also a different word having a different meaning. Jesus said, Thou art Petros, and that is a rock like you could pick up and throw. Thou art a pebble, a stone, upon this rock, which is a great ledge of rock, I'm going to build my church. Jesus was not saying to Peter, I'm going to build my church upon you, Peter. Jesus actually used the name of Peter to contrast Peter with what the church was going to be built upon. What in that context do you think the church is going to be built upon? The very truth that Peter had confessed when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They have to be careful with this argument because some have said, that uh, Petra could never refer to Peter because uh, this word can never refer to a man. Well, that's not so, because when it speaks of Jesus Christ being the stone which the builders rejected, this is the word that is used. So if you've heard an objection to this argument, that is an objection to the argument that was just stated, but the fact still does stand in this text, and let me make it simply. Jesus said, after Peter had confessed that he was the Christ, the Son of God, you are Peter, and upon this great ledge of rock, you are a stone, upon this great ledge of rock, I am going to build my church. Jesus contrasted what he was going to build his church upon to Peter. And to give some support to that, we can turn over to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter and verse 11. And there the apostle Paul, speaking of what he had done in planting the church at Corinth, talked about laying a foundation and it says that there is one foundation and that is Jesus Christ and if we're going to lay a foundation for the church there is no other foundation that man can lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ what is the foundation of the church without any doubt without any question 
Jesus Christ is what was the church founded upon. Jesus Christ. And there is no other foundation for the church than Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11. Then that's what Peter confessed. Jesus Christ, you're the Son of God. And Jesus said, upon that rock I'm going to build my church. And Paul just makes it clear for us that the church is built upon Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible teaching that. How right would I be if I said, the church is built upon Peter? The church is built upon Peter, the weakness of human flesh, in contrast to the deity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? No. The church is built upon Jesus Christ. The Bible is explicit, and it says that. And Jesus contrasts what the church is built upon to Peter in Matthew, the 16th chapter. The church was not built upon Peter. I can ask you, and you can tell me, in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, what was the church built upon? What is its foundation? And you have seen it in your Bible, and it is Jesus Christ, and that is what Peter confessed. And it's that rock that the church is built upon, not Peter. The grammar denies that it is Peter. A specific passage denies that it is Peter. But was Peter given primacy? Was he given a supremacy over the rest of the apostles? I do not deny Peter's ability. I do not deny his natural leadership. And anybody with the capacities possessed by Peter is going to stand out. I do not question that. I read the history of the New Testament. I can see that. But does that amount to his being made supreme authority over the rest of the apostles. I'll tell you, if it did, all of the apostles missed it. They didn't know it. Turn to Luke, the 22nd chapter. This is the occasion where Jesus has eaten the Passover with the 12. He institutes the Lord's Supper. This is the occasion when he washes their feet. And there's a problem in the midst of the supper and I hope I'm giving these passages right. I just Luke 22, and I turned to John, so I hope I didn't say John. Luke, the 22nd chapter, and verse 24. On this occasion, the text says, And there arose also a contention among them, which of them was accounted to be greatest. Oh. <laughs> If Jesus had made Peter supreme back over here in Matthew, the 16th chapter, and even when he said he gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and that's a passage we're going to look at in just a moment. The rest of them missed it because at this last occasion, on the very night Jesus is betrayed and is going to die for our sins the next day, they still are arguing about who is the greatest. So obviously they had not understood that Jesus had assigned Peter the greatest position. But the interesting thing to me is the next verse, which says, in effect, that nobody has the greatest position. Look at what it says. And he said unto them, this is Luke 22, 25, and he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles have lordship over them, and they, have authority, they that have authority over them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. Now they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest and Jesus said, that's not the way it's going to be among you. There are the Gentiles and they put great ones in authority over them, but that's not the way it's going to be among you. Now the Roman Catholic system does have a great one over everybody else. And Jesus said, among my followers, that is not the way it is going to be. Was Peter given a primacy? If so, the twelve, the others of the twelve did not know it. And Jesus denied that anybody was going to be greatest. And in Roman Catholicism, the Pope is the greatest. And not only did the rest of the twelve not know it, and Jesus said no one was going to have it, in practice, Peter didn't have it. In 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter and verse 5, Paul said, I reckon that I am not one whit behind the very chiefest apostles. I know for sure 
that Peter didn't have supremacy or primacy over Paul because Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said, I am not one whit behind the very chiefest apostles. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 5. He makes the same claim in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter and verse 11. And there's an incident that is illuminating in the life of Paul and Peter. Paul is up there in the northern, well, way up above northern Palestine at the church of Antioch, and there are a lot of Gentiles that have been converted. And up until this time, the gospel has been kept principally for the Jews. And I know I've heard people today discuss the question, can a Jew be a Christian? Yes, of course, obviously, Paul was, Peter was. But you know the first great issue in the church? That issue was, can Gentiles be Christians? And uh, because of that, Peter has gone up to Antioch, and he has learned at the household of Cornelius and converting them that Gentiles may be Christians, and he is associating with these Gentiles. But then some other Jews come from Jerusalem up there to Antioch. And Peter draws back, and he stops associating with the Gentiles. And because of this dissimulation, this hypocrisy, Galatians 2, 11 finds Paul saying, and, and he calls Peter by his Aramaic named Cephas. And I withstood him to the face because he stood condemned. Do you reckon anybody in the Catholic Church today is going to walk up to the Pope and withstand him to the face when he is wrong about something? And Peter was wrong here. And Paul didn't say, I'm sorry, I bow before you, Holy Father, and I kiss your foot and forget about it. He said, I withstood him to the face because he stood condemned. Paul didn't know it if Peter had primacy, and Peter didn't know it because he took it. And he didn't stay mad about it because later on he will write about our beloved brother, Paul. Paul withstood him to the face. And you don't find Peter claiming the kind of adoration the Pope gets. Turn over to Acts the 10th chapter to the conversion of the household of Cornelius that I alluded to just a moment ago. Cornelius is this good man who needs to hear the gospel in order to be saved. And Peter is being sent to him and he knows Peter is coming. And look what happens when Peter comes into his house. He has all of his friends and all of his family gathered together there. Acts 10, 25. And when it came to pass that Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised them up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Did Peter claim supremacy here and see the propriety in this man bowing before him? He did not. He was disturbed at that, took him and lifted him up and said, I am a man as you are. Peter did not claim supremacy. He did not claim primacy. I mentioned kissing the Pope's foot. This is what the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 12, page 270, says about that. It has been observed as early as the 8th century as a characteristic act of reverence by which all the faithful honor him. And the cardinals kiss the Pope's foot, and others do. I think more often now we hear people kissing the Pope's ring because all sorts of people who are not Catholics go in and they kiss his ring. But the kissing of the... Peter would not even let a man bow before him. Get up. I am a man as you are. Peter did not claim primacy or supremacy. Now let's go back to Matthew, the 16th chapter, that text I said I wanted us to get back to. But isn't there a supremacy given to Peter in what Jesus promised him when he said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 16, verse 19. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And the claim is this, that Peter here was given authority to bind his will on the earth, and God would take care of it in heaven. And he could loose and he could permit whatever he wanted to on the earth, and God would record that in heaven. Now, there is absolutely no excuse for any Catholic scholar interpreting that passage that way. 
because the language the New Testament was in literally says, it can be said this way. It is too bad that men had misrepresented those words. It literally says, whatsoever thou shalt have bound, or whatsoever thou shalt bind on the earth shall be having been bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be having been loosed in heaven. What Jesus said to him, Peter, this is your task. It is to take what is bound in heaven and bind it on the earth. And it is to take what God has loosed or permitted and you loose that on the earth. Peter was not given any power, any discretionary power as to right and wrong or to make religious law. He was told explicitly, you make what religious law has been made in heaven and you permit what has been permitted in heaven. That is your task. And in you doing this, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And you know, if you know what is bound in heaven and you know what is loosed in heaven, you know the way to heaven and you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But the significant thing is that this was not given just to Peter. Look in Matthew, the 18th chapter and verse 18. And here Jesus is speaking to the 12. And he says, Verily I say unto you, what things soever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and what things soever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 20, for where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You see, he wasn't talking to Peter alone. And back in your context, you will see he's talking to the twelve. So these words do not suggest that Peter had a primacy. First of all, he was not given discretionary power. He was told to do God's will and declare God's will on the earth. God's will. And the rest of the twelve were told exactly the same thing. And you cannot say that these words being told to Peter gave him a supremacy over the rest when the rest were given the same power and told to do exactly the same thing. But Peter was told, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Yes, and as we go forward in the Bible, we find Peter preaching the word of God, but we find a very explicit way in which he did that. And he was not alone in his task. Turn to 1 Peter. And remember, the point we're discussing is, did Peter have primacy? Did he have a supremacy? Did he have something that nobody else had? That's the question. Is he the only one who fed the sheep? In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 1 and 2, the text says, The elders, therefore among you, I exhort, who am a fellow elder. Peter claimed no primacy or supremacy there. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, who am also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed to you elders, he says, tend the flock of God which is among you, exercising the oversight, seeing over them, not of constraint, but willingly according to the will of God, and so forth. And telling them not to be lords over the flock, not to be masters over the flock. We who are shepherds, we who are elders, are not masters over the flock. And if there's one thing the Pope is today, he is master. Turn to Acts, the 20th chapter, and verse 28, and find here Paul addressing elders and what he says to them specifically. Remember now, Peter was an elder. He had fellow elders. And here is Paul speaking to some of those fellow elders. And in verse 28, you can see he's talking to elders in Acts 20, verse 17. He's talking to the elders from Ephesus specifically. And he says to them, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. But he shared that responsibility as an elder with other elders. Peter was not the only one assigned to feed his sheep. In that command, there is no primacy given to Peter. as having primacy in any action or pronouncement. In fact, there's this problem over in Acts 15 involving the problem up there at Antioch that we mentioned earlier where all these Gentiles have become Christians. And the Jews down here in Jerusalem say, look, you've got to be circumcised before you can be saved. In essence, that is, you've got to become a Jew before you can be saved. Gentiles can't be Christians. You've got to become a Jew first. And so, 
since some people from Jerusalem had gone up to Antioch teaching that, the church at Antioch said, listen, go down there to where these fellows came from, Paul and Barnabas, and get this thing settled. So Paul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem. And they meet there with all of the congregation, and there with the elders and the apostles, we find Paul and Barnabas speaking about God's work among the Gentiles, and Peter also speaking about the household of Cornelius, Cornelius being a Gentile, and his becoming a Christian. And Peter is simply a witness as are Paul and Barnabas, and it is James who makes the pronouncement. If you care to take a look at Acts the 15th chapter after all of this controversy in verse 13. And after they had held their peace, Peter has spoken, Barnabas has spoken, Paul has spoken. And after they held their peace, James answered, saying, Brethren, hearken unto me. And he gave the solution, and he declared Gentiles may be Christians as Gentiles. They do not have to keep the law of Moses. And then look at verse 22. This is an occasion where Peter is. And there's a problem in the church at Antioch and there's a problem in the church at Jerusalem and Jerusalem needs straightening out about this and the brethren in Antioch need to know that Jerusalem accepts them. And so what happens in verse 22 is this. Then it seemed good to the apostles, not to Peter, the apostles, plural, and the elders with the whole church to choose men out of their company and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas and Barnabas and Silas, chief men among the brethren, and they wrote thus by them. Here are the apostles and the elders and the church writing by these chief men who are to go up to Antioch and say, Brethren, we have seen the truth. You are Christians and we accept you. And they wrote thus by them in verse 23, The apostles and the elders and brethren unto the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia greeting. Now what's the significance of all of that? If Peter had primacy, if he were Pope, why did not he take over that meeting and just give his pronouncement and send the papal annunciation up there and solve the whole thing? Peter was simply a witness. It was James who gave the decision, citing the Holy Spirit's words in the Old Testament, and the apostles and the elders and the whole church wrote to the brethren up there. This was not an act such as you would find taking place in the Roman Catholic Church today, which has a single head of the church who is the father and who speaks ex cathedra or ex cathedra, and he declares the truth and everybody must believe it. Peter did not act like that. Peter did not have what the Pope today claims to have, and that's evident. In these points we have seen none of the other apostles understood Peter to have primacy. Paul withstood him to the face, and we find that he did not claim to have such supremacy that people should bow before him. He identified himself as just a man. He had no more power than the rest of the apostles had. They all were to bind God's will on the earth and loose whatever God had loosed. And in an occasion where, if ever he were pope, he had the chance to demonstrate it, he was simply a witness. Somebody else announced the decision, and the whole church was in on writing the letter. We find an entirely different situation there than we find in Roman Catholicism. But was Peter bishop of Rome? There is no historical or scriptural evidence that Peter ever was in Rome. Now, I know that people speak of it today just automatically as if he were, but it is based solely upon Roman Catholic tradition. The scriptural evidence is that he never was in Rome. In Romans, the 16th chapter, where Paul is writing a letter to the church at Rome, he addresses 27 specific individuals, I think 25 of them by name. And Peter's not addressed. Isn't it strange that when Paul is writing, some of the faithful brethren there in the church at Rome and mentions those who are of significance and who have worked so faithfully, that he doesn't mention Peter. If Peter were there and Peter were Pope, certainly he would be one of these who is greeted. The evidence, the suggestion is that he wasn't there. And besides that, later when Paul is in Rome, he writes seven letters from Rome and he never mentions Peter being there. I'll tell you what he says about who is with him 
finally, if you'll turn over to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and let's see if we can get an idea as to who is left there in Rome at this particular time in standing by Paul. 2 Timothy 4, verse 10. Started with verse 9, as Paul says to Timothy, Give diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas forsook me, having loved this present world, and went to Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is useful to me for ministering, and so forth. Verse 16, At my first defense, no one took my part, but all forsook me. Paul said, at my first defense and at my first hearing, nobody else took my part. All forsook me. Peter is there. Peter is the head of the church. Would Peter have forsaken him? Especially when we can turn over to 2 Peter, the third chapter and verse 15, and find Peter writing of Paul, our beloved brother Paul. Can you see Peter, the head of the church in Rome, and Paul in this trouble at Rome, and Peter never coming to his aid, never doing anything, so that Peter, Paul can say, only Luke is with me. All the rest have forsaken me. If Peter were there, I suppose that means that Peter did not stand up and stand with the Apostle Paul. The evidence is that Peter was not in Rome. He was certainly not there when he claimed to be, or not when he claimed to be, but when the Catholic Dictionary claims that he was. The Catholic Dictionary claims that he became the Bishop of Rome in A.D. 43. The Book of Romans was written in A.D. 58, 15 years later. There is evidence that there was no apostle in Rome at that time, and the evidence is this. Turn and look at Romans, the first chapter in verse 11, where Paul states one of the reasons that he wants to come to Rome. And he said, that I may impart some gift to you. What gift did apostles impart to anyone? Turn over to Acts, the eighth chapter, and the conversion of the Samaritans. Philip has preached there. People have believed they have been baptized. But even though Philip can work miracles, he cannot impart this power to anybody else. Apostles have to come from Jerusalem. And incidentally, if you look in verse 14, in the last words, who is it that comes from Jerusalem and has power to impart these gifts? Peter and John. Verse 15. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And it's a particular aspect of the Holy Spirit, as we'll see in just a moment. For as yet it was fallen upon none of them, only they had been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they, Peter and John, the apostles who come from Jerusalem, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money to bribe them that he might have that power also. But do you get the picture? Here are these new Christians, and there is something of the Holy Spirit to be imparted to these people, and it can't be imparted except by apostles. And apostles come, and one of the apostles that comes is Peter, to lay their hands upon these people that they might receive the Holy Spirit. What gifts came by the laying on of the apostles' hands? Turn with me to Acts the 19th chapter, where Paul goes to Ephesus, and he teaches a number of people there, and they are baptized. And look at what transpires there in verse 5. Acts 19, 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Paul, an apostle, lays his hands upon people, and they speak in tongues and prophesy by the Holy Spirit. In Acts, the eighth chapter, people cannot receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit until apostles come down from Jerusalem and lay their hands on them, and Peter is one. Wherever Peter is, Peter may lay his hands on people, and they may receive these spiritual gifts. Paul wants to go to Rome that he might impart to them some gift. Peter ain't there. If Peter were there, Peter could have taken care of it. He was supposed to become Pope of Rome in 43 A.D., in 58, Peter still wasn't there. All of the evidence in the Bible is that Peter never was in Rome. We read of him being in a lot of places, but we never read of him being in Rome. So we started this lesson 
talking about the Roman Catholic Church being the one true church because it was apostolic. And what they mean by that was it is founded upon Peter and the apostles and the successors to the apostles, a primacy being given to Peter, which we've seen the Bible doesn't teach. The church built upon the, on Peter, and we have seen that the church is built upon Jesus Christ. And we have seen that the evidence says that Peter never was in Rome. Let me read to you just a bit now. And I'm going to read to you from... Uh, an appendix to a Roman Catholic edition of the New Testament. And it's in appendix 2, page 240. But how are we to explain the silence of the New Testament and Clement of Rome on the existence of the monarchical bishop? The silence of the New Testament about the existence of a monarchical bishop. There was no bishop that had kingly power. There's a silence in the New Testament. This Catholic edition says in its appendix, the natural explanation of St. Paul's silence, which would apply with even greater force to the sparse references in Acts to the organization of the local churches, we don't find in the book of Acts or in, or in Paul's writings or anywhere else evidence of a monarchical bishop in the New Testament churches. And its explanation is that at the time St. Paul wrote, monarchical bishops had not been appointed. Paul wrote as late as the late 60s. And Peter was supposed to have become pope, which would make him not only a monarchical bishop, but the head over all the monarchical bishops in 43 A.D., but here's an appendix in a Catholic edition of the Bible added by Catholic authorities admitting that in the New Testament there is no evidence of a monarchical bishop. There's all sorts of difficulty then with the claims made for Peter and the church being built upon him and him being the first pope at Rome and the bishops of Rome since that time being his successors. All of that then begins to fall apart. In fact, if you look at the lists of the popes, in various Catholic authorities, you will find omissions in some places. You will find admissions that some of the people are fictitious that are there. Sometimes you'll find one man's name in this position. You'll find another man's name in that position. Suppose I handed you a list of the President of the United States, and somebody else handed you a list, and somebody else handed you a list. It said, okay, these lists the Presidents of the United States, and you got to comparing them, and you found some men left out. He, he left it. Here's George Washington left out over here. Here's Abraham Lincoln left out over here. And besides that, here's Abraham Lincoln put way back here, and here's George Washington put way down here. And here's some people who never were president also listed in there. What would you think of the accuracy of those lists? Well, that's exactly the way the lists of the popes are. And the Catholic Encyclopedia just says we know little or nothing of the first ten popes. And the reason was because there weren't any popes back in those days, as we'll see in a moment. But they admit that and then saying only one of the next ten is a clearly defined figure in history. And yet, they will speak in their catechisms with all assurance that we have an unbroken line of succession all the way back to the bishops of Rome through Peter. But when you start studying their lists, that argument likewise falls down. And besides that, did Rome actually have supremacy, supposedly from Peter. What I've got here are where the first seven general councils were held. And we've got the year in which they were held. Now, by the time they start being held, apostasy has already set in. We are a long way from the purity of the New Testament church by this time. I do not believe this represents all the people of God. I believe God still had his people who were serving him faithfully. But in that which had become significant, there was the Eastern Church and there was the Western Church. The Western Church eventually became the Roman Catholic Church. The Eastern Church became what? The Greek Orthodox Church and all the rest of the Orthodox churches, whether... Um, well, Russian Orthodox and all of those groups of people. 
And if anybody's got the stronger of the argument for having supremacy, the Eastern Church would, as you will see from these figures. The first general council was held in AD 325 at Nice. There were 315 Greek bishops, or from the East there, three Roman bishops. That doesn't look like Rome had the supremacy, does it? The second was held in 381 at Constantinople, 149 Greek bishops, one Roman bishop. The third general council in the year 431 at Ephesus in the east again, 350 Greek bishops, three Roman bishops. The fifth, 523 the year, 53 the year in Constantinople, 164 Greek bishops, six Roman. The sixth general council, the year 680 in Constantinople, 51 Greek bishops, five Roman bishops. The seventh, you can read this, I don't have to do all this, do I? But I'm going to. 787 at Nice, again in the east, 370 Greek bishops, seven Roman bishops. How much influence did the Western church, or what became the Roman Catholic church, have in these early years? It was not the dominant influence, evidently, either in where they met or the majority of the people that were there. And in none of these did the Bishop of Rome issue pronouncements as the head of the church. The whole argument from history then for the primacy of the Pope falls apart when you look at the facts. The scriptural argument for Peter being the first Pope and having a primacy and the Bishop of Rome having primacy has already also fallen apart. Well, let me hasten on. I'm, Marlene told me, said, you will never get through all this, and she's right. Um, this is an important point, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of historical things and then quit. How's the church going to exist then? I mean, we had the church back here, and we got Peter over there, and if we had an unbroken succession from Peter, then we've got the church. Without that, how are we going to have the church? Well, I'll tell you. In Luke, the 8th chapter, and verse 11, Jesus spoke of his kingdom, and he spoke of it being established and spread by spreading the word of God, and said the seed is the word of God, spoken of as the word of the kingdom in Matthew, the 13th chapter. So the word of God is planted into the hearts of people, and they respond to that, and you have then in existence the kingdom of God. An example can be found of that in Acts the 18th chapter and verse 8. As Paul has gone to the city of Corinth and he preaches there, and it says, Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. We find Jesus saying, My kingdom comes into existence when you take the word of God and plant it into the hearts of people. And people obey that word. We find Paul taking the word of God and he goes into the city of Corinth and preaches it and people believe it and are baptized. And later in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, he can address a letter unto the church of God which is at Corinth. How does the Lord's people, how does the Lord's church exist? The word of God is preached. People obey the word of God. And they follow the word of God and there the Lord's church exists wherever that is done. In other words... If you visit down South Carolina sometime and, and you ate one of those delicious watermelons down there and you said, I want to grow one of those in Vermont. I want to have one of those in Vermont. You can do that. You know how you can do it. You can go down every day or so and train that vine. It's going to have to grow awful fast before winter comes. <laughs> and you can trace that vine all the way up here to Middlebury, Vermont, or Addison County. And you've got one of those South Carolina watermelons up here in Vermont. Or there's another way you can do it. You can go down there and get a seed from one of those watermelons, bring it up here, plant it in the ground as soon as it's warm enough and hope it doesn't get cold soon enough that that watermelon will grow. And surely enough, a watermelon just like those in South Carolina, same kind of watermelon, same sugar content, you've got the same watermelon they had down there because you planted the seed. Now Roman Catholicism wants to grow the vine all the way here. But that vine has to grow through some wicked centuries and some wicked times and some wicked popes. And a lot of unscriptural practices arise over those centuries that are bound upon... Forget it. Go back to the original century, get the Word of God, bring it down here into the 20th century, plant it into the hearts of men, and Jesus said, that's how my church comes into existence. But how came the Catholic Church into existence? Well... Let me give you some passages, and you can write these down and check them later, and I'll save you some time. In Acts, the 20th chapter, verses 29 and 30, 
Paul told the elders from Ephesus, men from among your own selves are going to arise to draw away disciples after them. In uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, the Thessalonians are looking for the coming of Christ, and Paul said that's not going to happen until the falling away comes first. And in verse 7 he says, the mystery of lawlessness does already work. So there was to be a falling away, there was to be an apostasy, and it was already at work in those early times. And in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 3, the Spirit saith expressly that in the later times some shall fall away from the faith. And this is a passage we're going to look at more extensively in another lesson because some doctrines there are identified with the falling away, and some of these doctrines we find in Roman Catholicism. But the New Testament church says there was going to be a falling away. This is what? happened. We have seen there was a simplicity in the New Testament church. There was a congregation of people here, a congregation of people here, and a congregation of people here, and all over. In each one of these congregations there were elders. In Acts 14, 23, they appointed them elders in every church, a plurality of elders in each church. And these elders had the oversight of those congregations. And do you know that nobody on earth had more oversight or authority to oversee more than one flock of people? The next position in the church is Jesus Christ. They had, what are the apostles? Well, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7, they were earthen vessels in which the word of God was. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 19 and 20, they were the Lord's ambassadors. They were empowered to speak on his behalf, to bind on earth what's bound in heaven, to loose on earth what's loosed in heaven. But as far as organization was concerned, there were individual groups of Christians. They were led and guided and seen over by elders in each congregation. Nobody could oversee more than one flock of people, one congregation. First Peter 5, 2, tend the flock of God which is among you, the elders are told. But after some time passed, among the elders, one became the presiding elder, the president. And later on, he became called the bishop. And after a while, these bishops would meet in council and they would discuss and take directives back to the congregations. So you have a meeting of these bishops, and then there was finally a bishop who was put over this whole area, and eventually there came to be five areas like this. There was the bishop at Alexandria, the bishop at Jerusalem, the bishop at Antioch, the bishop at Constantinople, and the bishop of Rome and you had five of them. And after a while, two of them were the most significant, and that's the bishop at Constantinople and the bishop at Rome. And in the year 588, now this is over 500 years after Jesus has established his church, and there was to be a falling away, and it had begun even in New Testament times, and we find this is a departure from what Jesus established. In 588, John the Faster, and he was called John the Faster not because he was quick, because he was in the Olympics, because he fasted. He claimed to be universal head over the church. And the bishop at Rome, Gregory the Great, answered him and said he couldn't do that. And he used a passage. And the passage he used was Matthew 23, 9. Call no man your father on the earth. One is your father who is in heaven. You cannot claim to be the universal head and father of the church on earth. Now that was Pope of Rome who said that, or one who has claimed to be a pope at Rome. And today the pope at Rome says he is the universal father of the church, so you have two infallible popes contradicting one another. I have not seen an explanation for that, but you have them teaching diametrically opposed ideas. Well, Gregory died, but he was powerful, and he did consolidate a lot of power in Rome. In fact, Focus, the emperor of Rome, called him, said, Gregory, you take it, you're the universal father. And Gregory renounced that. But the second successor after him, Boniface, in 607 A.D., took that title to himself and began to exercise that power. And now you have the origination of the papacy. And yet it still wasn't that strong in the chart you saw over there. Most of the influence was still in the East. But it continued to grow more and more toward Rome. And finally, they had the power and the Bishop of Rome came to be called 
the head of the church. Do you know when it was declared that he was infallible? Not until the year 1870 at the Vatican Council. We had Vatican II in the 1960s. But in 1870, he was called then infallible and not until that time. Incidentally, when we get to the 10 hundreds, the controversy over idolatry and images and a few other things come to the fore. And finally, the East Church and the West Church splits and they remain split until this day. So this apostasy from the Lord's Church grew into a monumental thing and then split into those two different groups. In the meantime, what is going on with the papacy and the Pope? Well, you'll find, I think, this excerpt interesting. The New York Catechism says, the Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth. By divine right, the Pope has supreme and full power in faith and morals over each and every pastor of his flock. He is the true vicar of Christ, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. And what we've stated this evening, you see all sorts of things wrong with all of that. He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogmas, the author and the judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth, the arbiter of the world, the supreme judge of heaven and earth. The Pope is the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all, being judged by no one. Paul judged Peter and says, Peter, you stand condemned, and I withstand you to the face. The Pope being judged by no one, God himself on earth. The New York Catechism. And Pope Leo XIII in his encyclical, The Reunion of Christendom in 1885, said of the Pope that he holds upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Peter didn't have that. Nobody else had that. Jesus Christ said, when it comes to putting men in authority over you, not so shall it be among you. All ye are brethren, Jesus Christ said. And then I think of the Pope being God himself on earth. Can I have a minute? <laughs> if you've got to leave, I'll excuse you. But if you can give me a minute. Remember when Jesus was with the disciples on the night he was betrayed? And... Uh, Philip said to him, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Here is Jesus Christ and in him we see God. We see what God is like. Here is the maker of this entire universe. He who is from everlasting to everlasting. And when we see a picture of him, what do we see? Somebody wanting all the earthly trappings he can dwelling in the mightiest and greatest palaces that man can afford here upon this earth, insisting that men bring him expensive gifts and presents. What we see God and Jesus Christ doing is serving, serving man. That is greatness. You know, God could have been as powerful as he is and mean, and we would not sing, How Great Thou Art. But we see how great thou art because in his tremendous power he is good and he loves us and he serves us. He became our servant, dying for us and taking the price for our sins. And you tell me the Pope, who has a jewel-laden crown where Jesus Christ had on a crown of thorns, you tell me the Pope takes the place of God on the earth and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus Christ, who had not where to lay his head, and you see the Pope dwelling in his huge palace with all of his servants, and he takes the place of God on the earth. And besides that, many of the popes, and this is admitted in all Catholic literature of history, that in the Middle Ages, many of the popes were just vastly immoral. Fathered children under all sorts of circumstances. Bribed people took bribes. No question about that. They had the place of God. Jesus Christ had the place of God on earth. And we see God in Christ. And what I see in Jesus Christ is not what I see in the popes. But in the meantime, in 1074, Pope Gregory VII made the state subservient to the church. Innocent IV began the Inquisition and subjugated England. And they could, they could uh, 
What do they do? They excommunicate. They could excommunicate a king. And I tell you, his kingdom is gone from him. There was one king who got the wrath of the Pope, and the Pope excommunicated him, and his followers now are leaving him, and he has to do something, and he comes and he begs the Pope's forgiveness, and the Pope wouldn't forgive him until he stood out there three days barefoot in the snow before the Pope's residence. And then the Pope forgave this king, and he had to have that, or he lost his kingdom, and he went back then in peace. That's the power the popes have had over kings in the past. There was Boniface VIII who issued his unum sanctum and he said all rulers must be subject to the Roman pontiff in order to obtain salvation. In the 1880s, Leo XIII condemned Americanism. He condemned freedom of religion is what he condemned specifically. Now, I'll have to say that Vatican II has altered that somewhat and I'm about through here. Here is a pope of Rome and he condemned the idea of people having the right of freedom to religion. But that's because at that time the popes had tremendous power and in the past centuries they had ruled governments. But Vatican II said, therefore government is to assume the safeguard of the religious freedom of all its citizens. That is a change in Roman Catholicism. But Notice this comment on that. The second duty derives from the general duty of government to assist the people in the performance of their duties. In this case, it is to show a general and undiscriminating favor toward religion in society and to assist in the creation of conditions that will help not hinder the people in the existence of their religious rights and the performance of their religious duties. The government is to help the people perform their religious duties and the idea there is to give tax money to Roman Catholic schools is what that is. Now, we have popes in the past who have denied religious freedom. Now, the government is supposed to protect religious freedom. But, in happier times, Pope Leo again writes, Owing to this time and the conditions we have where the church is not in control, we must exceed in some of these demands. But in happier times, the church will go its own way. Does that sound ominous to you? Here is the bottom line of that. Here is a pope saying, we must accede to these circumstances now because we've lost some power. But in happier times, we'll go our own way. And freedom of religion is wrong. On the other hand, the government should help freedom of religion. You've got one of two things. Either, either you've got two infallible popes in conflict, one saying religious freedom is right, and another saying religious freedom is wrong, or else, we had better never let that organization have its happier times again, or they will seek to enforce their will as they have in the past. I've got to quit tonight. And let's come to this then. Apostolistas. After all that, I can't even say it. Got tired and can't get it all out. I'll try it again. Apostolicity. Is that valid? I believe so. Should a church be apostolic? I believe so. What makes it apostolic? Is it because you can trace back through an evolving, changing succession? Why no, because here are all of these changes from what was apostolic. Or is a church apostolic because it has identity in service and obedience through the word of God with the apostles? And you can see the answer to that. Let that be our aim, to have identity with the apostles in service and worship the Word of God being our instructor, rather than trying to trace all back through history, through an evolution and through evil times, to try to say we are apostolic. That is not valid. Taking the Word of God and planting it down here and identifying with apostles in faith and in practice is what makes a church apostolic. I believe a church ought to be apostolic. We invite you to become a member of an apostolic church not some denomination. We invite you tonight to obey the same thing that people did in the New Testament when the gospel was preached and they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins in Acts 2.38. Those who received the word were baptized in verse 41. In verse 47, they were saved and added to the church. You don't have to worry about what church to join. You obey as those people did and God will save you and he'll add you to the same church he added them to. After that, follow the word of God in your service and in your life and in your obedience and you will continue a member of that church and you will be that cleansed body that Jesus Christ comes back for to take to heaven when this life is over. And if you're not a 
part of that you can be tonight. You and your faith can be baptized tonight for the remission of your sins. And God will add you to his church. It's that simple. That's what happened in the New Testament. Then follow his word. If you would obey him and you haven't, why don't you do so and come tonight while together we stand and sing. There's only one way to the kingdom of God. There's no matching way.
But thank you, Father, for your word and the instruction therein that we might know the way and that we might keep ourselves narrow. And where we do find ourselves wrong, we can find the way. We can correct ourselves because you have made it so through the Bible. We're thankful for Dale and his wife being here to spend their time with us and to bring, and Dale's bringing us the lessons that he has uh, that we might come to know better your word and the error taught in the world through us, throughout this area and throughout the world. We pray, Father, that you will help us to spend further time studying the things we have learned and we might be able to use them and, and speaking to others more laws that they might know the truth and so be saved. We ask that you would go with us now as we depart from this place and you would grant each one here a safe journey home. And again, we thank you for those who have come to spend this time with us this night. We ask your blessing upon your church home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.